Okay guys, so today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the principles of medical ethics. Um, your book does a lot with this, so I'm just going to kind of go through and explain a little bit, maybe give you a little bit more information. Uh, the first thing we need to talk about is the Hippocratic Oath. Um, the Hippocratic Oath is an ancient oath that physicians were required to take, and it's one of the most ancient of um, kind of ethical statements um, for physicians that we know of. It comes from Hippocrates, uh, who was a 5th century Greek. And it's kind of interesting because when you read the Hippocratic Oath, a lot of the things that it says are s similar to questions that we're kind of dealing with today. So here's the oath um, in full, and it begins with an invocation to the gods, and then um, talks a little bit about the relationship that the doctor ought to have with the person who taught him the art of medicine. But then once we get about halfway down the page, so right about here, um, we get to some of the medical statements. And the first one is um, to keep some, the patient from harm and injustice and to apply um, dietetic, which would mean uh, medical measures for the benefit of the sick according to ability and judgment. The second, not to give a deadly drug to anybody who asks for it. So this is um, counter to euthanasia, and this is back in the fourth century BC. Um, similarly, um, I will not give to a woman an abortive remedy. In purity and holiness, I will guard my life and my art. So no euthanasia, no abortion. The next statement is probably a little puzzling to you guys, um, but it says, I will not use the knife, ev not even on sufferers from stone, but will withdraw in favor of such men as are engaged in the work. What this means is that a doctor won't play as a surgeon. That there's already, um, back in this, um, this stage of time, uh, a separation between the doctor and the one who does um, surgery. So, um, and then um, the next statement keeps the doctor from any sexual mischief with anyone in the house of the person that they're visiting. Basically the idea is that there's a professional relationship between the doctor and the patient. Um, there's a statement about confidentiality. What I may see or hear in the course of treatment, um, which on no account one must spread, ab spread abroad, I will keep to myself, holding such things shameful, shameful to be spoken of. And then a statement at the end saying that if the doctor does all of these things, then they'll be blessed in their work. So uh, the first medical ethics principle that your book talks about is the principle of self-determination. And the principle of self-determination in essence means that the patient has the right to decide for themselves what medical care they're going to receive. So it's not the doctor's responsibility, it's not the patient's family's responsibility, it's the patient themselves. And so when, um, when that can happen, like for example, when the patient is conscious and um, fully aware and able to make a decision, they should be the ones to be making the decision. Now obviously there are some cases where this can't happen. Uh, somebody comes into an emergency room unconscious, the doctor's going to make the decisions for that person. If there's a small child who really can't understand the implications of what's happening to them, the doctor's going to make that kind of decision. Somebody is mentally, uh, mentally handicapped and can't make those kinds of decisions, then the doctor or the family has to make that decision. Um, but with self-determination, it's the idea that the person that all of this is happening to has the right to decide what's going to happen to them. Um, the next principle is the principle of bodily integrity and totality. And the idea here is that we should try as well as much as we can to, to maintain the bodily integrity of a person. So um, there shouldn't be um, surgeries done or uh, medical procedures that are done just because we can, but they ought to be done um, for the purpose of making the person better. Um, this is one of the reasons that there is an opposition in the Catholic Church for things like cosmetic plastic surgery um, or unnecessary operations. Um, the idea there is that these things put the patient at risk, they're an assault on bodily integrity, and um, they're unnecessary. Now there is a statement that if surgery is necessary in order to keep a disease from spreading or in order to you know, fix a problem, then that's okay. Um, and that statement is there in your text. Um, so for example, um, the church would have a problem with a nose job just because your nose doesn't look good enough for you, uh, but it would not have a problem 
with um, a person getting a nose job because they've got a deviated septum or sinus problems. Um, another you know piece here is a woman who undergoes uh, breast augmentation um, for just because she wants to improve the the look of her breasts. Um, that's non-therapeutic, whereas um, somebody who undergoes breast augmentation because of breast cancer um, and you know, had, they had to have a mastectomy in order to reconstruct what was there, that's more of a therapeutic means. And so this is where this uh, issue can kind of get a little tricky, um, but the idea is to try to keep the body together as, as much as possible. Um, the next piece has to do with informed consent. Um, and the idea here is that the patient should have all of the information that they need at their disposal um, before they make medical decisions. And this is really, really difficult when you look at it from a medical perspective. Number one, because a lot of medical information is very complicated. And so uh, for a lot of people, um, having informed consent is really, really hard. Um, I've got the little Homer Simpson quote here. Can you repeat the part of the stuff where you said all about the things? Um, for a lot of people, when doctors get into this kind of medical jargon, they kind of glaze over and they don't really quite understand what's being said. So the doctor has a responsibility both to give the patient all of the information that they need to have about their condition and to explain it in such a way that the patient will understand it, which is very difficult. And the other piece is that any treatment that the patient goes through has to be voluntary. It has to be something that the patient is willing to go through. Uh, it goes back to that principle of informed consent that we talked about earlier. So this is a place where communication for doctors is absolutely important. And it's a place where there have been a lot of issues in medical ethics. Um, there was a study uh, a few years ago from, I believe it was Harvard Medical School, that said that doctors weren't um, informing their patients well enough, that the patients were going into surgeries without really understanding the risks and the benefits. So this is a really important part of medical ethics. Um, the next piece here is truth-telling. Truth-telling is um, also kind of difficult. In a lot of areas of our lives, we tell lies in order to kind of smooth things over, right? I mean, there was this movie, The Invention of Lying, that came out a few years ago, and um, in the movie, if I can cue it up to the right place here, um, basically it's about a society where nobody ever lies Nah, this isn't working, never mind. It's about a society where nobody ever lies and this guy invents lying in order to kind of smooth things over. In some cases that works, I guess. Um, telling a white lie every once in a while in order to kind of smooth things over might be morally justifiable. That's something we could certainly talk about in class. But when you're talking about something as major as medical treatment, um, lies are just not acceptable because a person is going to be going through this treatment in order to deal with their disease or their problem and if you're telling that person a lie in order to get them to make this really momentous decision there is a grave grave moral problem with that uh, what this means is that doctors have to be truthful about what they say um, and even if the patient is going to be you know upset because of what they're being told. The doctor simply can't withhold information. If someone is dying, or if somebody has a life-threatening disease, that person needs to know that, and they can't be spared that information just to spare their feelings. Um, the next piece is confidentiality. That anything that is said in that doctor-patient relationship that has to do with the person's medical history um, must be kept confidential. Now. Why is that important? Well, it's important because if the entire community knows about a person's medical problems, those medical problems could be used against them. Um, if you know, for example, that somebody has mental illness, then that information could be used to keep that person from getting a job. If you know, for example, that someone has cancer, then that information can be used um, against that person. And so, you know, there's this cartoon here about this dot with this doctor posting a sign on the patient's back that says three months tops. And in essence, that would be the kinds of signs that we would all be walking around with. I mean, I'd have a sign on my back that says, 
you know, asthmatic has to take corticosteroids. And, you know, while that's a relatively minor thing, it's still something that is, you know, should be kept confidential. So um, those are the basic principles of medical ethics. We're going to look in the next video at the doctrine of double effect and how that applies um, to medical ethics.